Something died. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm here. <laughs> hey, welcome back. How's it going? Good, man. Yeah, you're bright and yellow today. Bright and yellow. Go I'm fast, call you don't big die. Bird. Big Bird today. Yeah. Uh, well, we're back in the studio, obviously, and we're back for another great episode to talk racing, uh, something that I'm not super familiar with myself. I can't really kind of financially support <laughs> going all in on racing uh, because I don't want to go halfway, right? So, um, But we do have a family uh, that it's in deeply invested into racing with their son, Wyatt. So uh, joining me today, we have Doug and Ray Jean, and I got it right, and Wyatt Hastings. Show's not over. <laughs> I'm probably going to screw it up before the day's over. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. How are you doing? Good, thanks. I'm doing great, thank you. Um, so, you know, I came aware of you guys uh, on a random chance at the Airway Heights Motocross Park on a UTV. Was it a practice day or was it a... I believe it was a practice day. So when you guys, they were running uh, evening practices over there. Yeah, yeah. So we went over there. I was just over there to get shots of people doing cool stuff and whatever and um, ran into you guys. And you guys were out there with an RS1. And the RS1 at the time was still fairly new at that point. Pretty interesting and some shock upgrades and whatnot. And then I realized the guy underneath the helmet was, uh, at the time, I think 13? 12. 12? Yeah. Good Lord. Uh, I have a 13 year old turning 15, uh, 14 here next month, and uh, I can't even imagine him being behind the <laughs> wheel of a of a of a thousand cc motor. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. Um, kind of give me the explanation of uh, you know let's let's go over the kind of who you are, what you're doing, and and what you've been up to lately, and then jump into kind of that backstory. So kind of give me the the back the full picture of the family and what you guys are doing. Um, <clears throat> well, I work full time. Uh, full-time dad, full-time race mechanic, um, and just traveling around, man, doing as much as we possibly can, um, with what we've got to get him where he wants to be in the future. So that's kind of where we're, where we're at right now. And Regina, are you also a full-time worker or? Yeah. So we got a full-time working family and we have Wyatt who is in, uh, are you still in middle school or freshman? Uh, freshman. Freshman. Where you go to high school? Uh, Wilson Creek. Wilson Creek. And so you guys are out of... Uh, that is a small school. Yes, it is. Because <laughs> you guys are out of Moses Lake, right? Yep. Yeah. We're just outside of Moses Lake, in between Wilson Creek and it, Moses. Is there more people in this room than there are in your class? <laughs> There's about eight people in my class. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, I, I graduated from, I think, 1,100 kids you know, inside Spokane's public school system. And, and Ian, you were from a pretty small... Yeah, there were 50 kids at my Reardon class and... Uh, Wilson Creek, like the only reason I know about Wilson Creek is I used to be in the farming industry. And so we would go through Wilson Creek often to go deliver stuff. Wilson Creek is uh, probably about a 200, maybe 200 yards long yeah. <laughs> yeah. down yeah. somewhere in there. It, it's not, it, it's pretty, you yeah. know, it's in a nice area. It's a pretty quiet area, but uh, yeah, it's uh, when you said that I just perked up. I'm like, man, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a K through 12 all in one schoolhouse. Yeah. And there's less than 250 kids there. Yeah, most people I know that were from Wilson Creek, when you ask them where they're from, they're like, Odessa. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what kind of trades are you guys working in as far as like small community? Um, I actually work for uh, Genie Industries. It's a Terex brand. So we build uh, man lifts and things like that. I'm a manager out there over one of the high bays with a couple different uh assembly lines uh complete fabrication department powder coat system uh, all that stuff i got you know a few hundred people working underneath me right that's cool yeah we actually uh at full river we actually work with genie yep. at an oe level so yep yeah. and regine what are you what Plural. kind of industry are you in <laughs> um towing i guess pretty much and repairs and maintenance on diesel trucks um gotcha. i pretty much just do the books there's three companies that i do that kind of manage for. there that's awesome. And uh, Wyatt, what do you do for a living? Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Breaks things. <laughs> breaks things and has to pass class. Oh. So um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of requirements do your parents have on you on your, on your education? Passing grades. Passing grades. <laughs> that's not too bad. I mean, I know, some, I know some racing families that are straight up like 4.0 if you want to keep doing this. 
No. No. <laughs> no. He just needs to. He just needs to get passing grades and graduate, man. That's. <laughs> Now, I, now, was I, that a battle that you lost, <laughs> or was that just some leniency on the parents? We want you to pass. We, we want you to pass seventh grade. Oh, come on! Yeah, right, right. Yeah, no, it's uh, you know, I, what kid loves school, right? I mean, right. not too many of them. So, with the amount of traveling we do, um, to go to races and takeover events and and everything else, um, through the summer he misses upwards of two weeks of school a month. Yeah. Um, and for him to get passing grades with missing that amount of school and being on the road that much, um, I didn't think it was, you know, a stretch just to say, Hey, come on, let's, let's get a C average here <laughs> yeah. at least and, and, and get through high school and then we can see where it's going to go after that. So that that's pretty typical in motocross. Yeah. You know, a lot of motocross kids are homeschooled and you have to be. It's yeah. Just... And we looked into homeschooling and especially with the whole COVID thing and, and a lot of it was remote anyway. Um, but he's not a remote learner. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, uh, work at working on the computers by himself at his own pace. Um, his pace begins to slow. And the the C's quickly drop to D's, and so so now he's back in school every other week, um, and and it seems to be working. That's because there's an RZR Pro in your garage, and that's what he's thinking about. <laughs> Actually, there's two pros in the garage. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah. So you guys still have the RS one? No, we sold that. Uh, we sold that one to uh, one of his racing buddies, uh, Graham, um, and he's racing it actually now too. So. That's awesome to keep it kind of in that that racing family. Yep, and I and I, I kind of get that from a lot of the experience that I've had with racing teams and, and people that are involved in racing is that you kind of you kind of grow a community around supporting each other. I mean, you basically. I mean, we have always talked about the UTV community being pretty supportive of each other in general, right? Someone's broken down, we're out there helping. Someone's stuck, we're out pulling them out. Whatever the case is, um, but in racing, it's just that more that one step tighter because basically you don't have the part you don't race. Right. And if you're not willing to, to give one, you're not, you're not going to be asking for one. Right. So, yep. um, so let's talk a little bit about how we started here. Um, you know, like I said, I met at you guys when, you, when Wyatt was 12, um, what kind of, what's the backstory on racing and, and how did you guys get involved and what's your off-road backstory? Um, really there's not a whole lot of off-road backstory before Wyatt. As far as it goes, I before mean, he was born, or <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, I, I rode, I rode, you know, dirt bikes, and you know, back in back in the day, I had the old ATC seventy three wheelers and and that stuff. But uh, it was just going out to the, the dunes there in Moses Lake, me and my dad, and you know, eight or ten buddies, and we'd load everything up in a home built wooden utility trailer and go out there and ride for the weekend and camp in a tent and, and, and do that. Um, as so far as those were the good old days right? back when those were actually <laughs> sand dunes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, I thought it was great. We'd go to the mountains and ride and stuff like that. So there, I, I never was involved in actual racing. Um, when Wyatt came along, um, he, he took off with, with everything. I mean, he started riding a, a pedal bike at a super young age. He um, rode the dirt bike before he did the pedal bike. That, that's true. That's true. So we bought him, bought him a little CRF 50 when he was three, three years old. And, uh, you know, she was a little concerned with it. We took him out to her parents' place where she had some acreage and I fired it up and put him on it and away he went. Right. So, um, so at a young age, he's been riding. Now, how far out did he go before you saw him back again? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he knew exactly what he was. It's, like, it's almost like he was, uh, born to ride something, right? I mean, he, I, I explained him how to work the gears one time and he, you know, was going through gears, shifting up, shifting down. Um, so yeah, he's actually started, started riding, um, dirt bikes, which was a little CRF 50 when he was three years old. Um, he actually started racing that dirt bike, I think, that same year. Um, so he's been racing on a track since he was about three years old. So that's crazy. I mean, my my son is uh, eleven now, and he's just now starting to outgrow his fifteen. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you, think, by that time, that, you were almost into an RS1. <laughs> I, I think that's doing it right, though. I really think there's a lot of value in starting them on two wheels. Right, yeah. And, and he stayed on two wheels for a long time. Um, I think two wheels develops reflexes that you wouldn't normally get. Right, it does. Um, reactions Five. and... We've talked a little bit with um, our friend George Hamill about the fact that transitioning from two wheels to four wheels is a unique perspective that the racing industry, you know, some of the racers have and some of them don't. And it's pretty obvious on the track who does and who doesn't because there's some synapse stuff that is learned during that development that you don't have if you just start on four wheels. Yeah, if you were to break down a percent uh, percentage like in two wheel line selection probably makes up somewhere around 30 percent, 40 percent of how you're probably going to finish it's a big big deal and uh, you take that onto four wheels it's a good good place to be for sure so growing out of the the two wheel 50 what you go up into uh apex 90 cc quad yeah. and straight into a four wheeler yep yeah he uh broke his leg yeah he broke his tibia on, uh, it, on the two on, wheels on the yeah. on the dirt bike yeah he uh, so the doctor prescribed a, a quad <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah right so so he uh he wanted to try something different, right? So uh, he came in a corner a little hot and uh, overshot the berm and straight up over top of the berm he went on his little 50 dirt bike, landed in some rocks on the other side of the other side of the track there, and ended up breaking his tibia. At what, at what age was this? Probably five four, or six. five, five. Yeah, I think you're five or six. He was in kindergarten. Yeah. Gotcha. And uh, he came off the track in pain right but <laughs> as a <laughs> yeah tell the story <laughs> tell the story uh -oh. here we go <laughs> so so at the time he was racing the uh the crf 50 we had bought him a polaris actually uh polaris predator 90 oh cool and uh and it was kind of you know farm quad type deal right but he wanted to go out and play on it in the track too um and uh so he come off the track and he was in a bunch of pain and of course, mom takes him in the, the camper and takes his boot off, gets him some ice and this and that. And, uh, his next moto was, I don't know, like three or four motos later. And they start calling for him down at the gate and me being the dad and, <laughs> and the bad guy, I'm trying to get him to get back out there and race. You know, you right. fall off a horse, you want to get back on it. <laughs> I don't want you just laying in here sobbing, right? Zip ties and duct tape. <laughs> Well, at the time, we didn't know it was broke, and even the MT <laughs> said it, it didn't seem to be broke, right? So I'm in the trailer trying to stuff his riding boot back on this broken leg, <laughs> and, he's screaming, Hold and still. he's screaming and yelling at me. I finally get his boots on, get them all strapped up, and uh, then he can't walk on it. So I'm just like, okay, well, maybe maybe it is broke, or maybe it is, <laughs> maybe it is a little worse than I'm thinking here. So uh, we ended up packing up and heading to the doctor, did some x-rays, and yeah, he, uh, he had broke his tibia on that race. So that was one of my... Uh, what do you remember from that? Ouch. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just being in the middle of the air and then next minute in pain? Yeah. Dan trying to shove my boot on. <laughs> Miserable. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the proud dad moments of the yeah. uh, the racing career right there. That's character building, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So you went into the quads. Uh, how long you know, were you on the quad before you were actually on the track? Mm, I was on the track when I got on the quad, basically. Just, yeah. just, just that's where you started warming up and never <laughs> got off, huh? Basically. So um, going into the quads, what what did you feel was different between... I mean, that was a pretty young age, right? Yeah. There's not a whole lot that you know, you're not going to have a lot of strategy going on in your head per se, but, uh, what was kind of one of your perspectives on jumping from two wheels to four wheels? Uh, probably just like the learning curve with line selections. You got two tires. Now you gotta be worried about instead yeah. of the one and then leaning into the corners and all that just big difference. Keeping kinda, the momentum up with four wheels, a lot heavier machine. Yeah. Kind of almost like drifting in certain situations yeah. instead of just tucking it into a line. And, yeah. Yeah. And you then also have the additional width, right? So now you're also thinking, where's that tire touching the other guy's tire and, yeah. and all that stuff? Have you ever caught tires and gone over? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you started, uh, so you were saying that was around five, six years old yeah. that you jumped into that. And then how long did the quads kind of last? He raced quads. 12. Yeah, he raced quads clear up until we got him the RS1. Wow. 
So that that hasn't been too long ago. I mean, realistically, talking about the timeline here, that the jump from quads to UTVs has been fairly recent. Um, what was your perspective on? Well, first of all, how did you go from you know you know uh, a, a fifteen hundred dollar dirt bike to a probably a thirty five hundred dollar quad, four thousand dollar quad to then a fifteen thousand dollar UTV? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like to spend money. No. Um, so I, I love how your wife's look was like, oh, this is going to be good. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, hmm. What version of the story's coming out? Yeah. Right. Um, so little do you know, she's never heard these retail prices before. <laughs> she's a way to Cats out of the bag. I have a feeling if she runs books, she knows every yeah. cent that's gone into this program. So, so he's a speed freak, man. Um, the kid, the kid goes 150%. On no matter what he's riding, no matter what track he's on, um, he's not reckless by any means. You've seen him race and you've seen him ride, but he knows nothing but uh, full throttle. No pun intended. <laughs> We're um, okay with it. And and he just he hammers down no matter what. I mean, you give him a trail ninety, and he's going to go out there and and try clearing a double with it, right? So I mean, he's just he's just that kind of a kid. Is he going to try and clear a double, or is he going <laughs> to? No, no, no. I'm, I'm serious. Like there. you know whether or not you can. Right. Right. Sometimes we were actually <laughs> we were actually just talking about that on the way up here. You know, was learning learn a little bit more of his geometry and and trajectory of jumps and the weight of his machine and the speed he needs to carry to to clear things and 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 like that on the track. So so he's he's getting his education is becoming more useful to him now um, when he can directly reflect on what he's doing outside of school. So. So yeah, you're right. Um, he, he'll be able to look and see whether he can clear things or not. But uh, so so going back to the the whole four wheeler thing. So he started out on a little dirt bike. He went to like you say, it was a thirty five hundred dollar Apex. Of course, I completely fully built that with ATV four play, long travel suspension, and Elka shocks, and too fast ninety cc motor. And he rode that thing for for quite some time. And then uh, he went from that to a Raptor 250. Um, I picked up a Raptor 250 from Kenny Sanford there at uh, Tire Blocks. And, and he rode that up until 2018. But he, he pushes himself so hard and, and so fast, he, uh, he wrecked a lot on his four-wheeler. Um, and that was one of our... One of our um, deciding factors was putting him in a UTV, um, was, was get a cage around him, get him a little bit more secure inside of a machine. And if he does roll over, he's, he's not going to be injured as bad as he was getting injured on his four wheeler. Um, so how many bones have you broken beside your tibia? Broken that. And then I broke my hand and my side by side. So I've only broken two out the bones. Window? Uh, no, I slammed it. I tried to clear a triple and I landed on the face or like the face of the third bump to land on Cased it. it yeah just broke this bone into my hand just with your hands out front yeah yeah, yeah. hanging on the steering wheel stiff arming it so you really haven't had i mean you may have wrecked a bunch but you haven't you've gotten away pretty lucky i mean i know a lot of guys that have that have wrecked t- three times and have broken major <laughs> components yeah. of their body each time yeah his biggest his biggest injury is concussions um he's had been there he's had he's had a Numerous concussions um, from from wrecking, but as far as bone bone density, I think he's doing all right. Yeah, when you get to be my age, you're gonna have to write everything down. <laughs> Look forward to that. <laughs> um, but but amazingly enough, since he's been racing side by sides, uh, knock on wood, he hasn't uh, he hasn't had a a wreck, a major incident. Yeah, he's never he's never put it on its side. He's never put it on its top. Um, He's never, you know, never come up short enough on something to rip suspension off. Um, he's uh, he's really a, a smooth smooth racer in his side by side. So, so what was your perspective on transitioning? Like, whose idea was it to go into UTV? Was it his or yours or hers or? I just came home from school one day yeah. and there's a RS one sitting in the yeah. front, and Dad's like, "We're going to the dunes." Okay, don't gotta tell me twice. Yeah, it was my idea. <laughs> I, I ain't gonna lie. Now, did it start off as in I can get him into this car, or was it 
I could ride this around the track and, <laughs> and fall over. Out. No, that's all for Wyatt. Yeah. I, I, to be honest with you, I think I drove his RS1 two, maybe three times the entire time we owned it. Wow. You know, and that was maybe driving it up on the ramp or... As I say, loading it up on the trailer and yeah, getting it home. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that goes to my extent to driving his rigs, yeah. So do you do you guys have so now you guys have a pro but did be, before did you guys have an auxiliary car that you would kind of nope. tote around with no nope. so if he broke down on the other side of the track it was a long walk huh right <laughs> yep so so um, anything you didn't know how to wrench on you now know <laughs> exactly <laughs> yep so what was uh the like I was saying what was the, your perspective on going from quad to the what was your per, what was your opinion of the thing when you showed up and all of a sudden it was there and all of a sudden he said that you're going to be in this thing and it was fun. I liked it. You know, as much as I was crashing on my quad, it was almost every weekend. It just <laughs> it was getting miserable at that point. But got in that, and then away I went. Kind of just game over for everything else, and yeah, new perspective and new new storyline from that point forward, huh? Had one really Wait. hard hit and graze and toss it home, and I was done. Just laying on the side of a double, just <laughs> dead, <laughs> knocked out, and yeah. Yeah, I've never shorted one. I've overshot them a few times, and that sucks equally as bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, you guys got into the RS1. Uh, at, at some point, sponsorships have to come into the play here. You know, we're we're talking about no longer, you know, a fifty dollar wheel or a you know whatever part that you can just source and, and tack on, right? Right. Um, now we're talking about big dollars and big investment. What what kind of perspective did you have going into this? Like, okay, I just bought a fifteen thousand dollar car you know what's the what's the potential of breaking and and replacing and all that like what's the financial hit on you guys and what's uh, and i'm not looking for numbers or anything i'm just how does that play into your guys's you know planning and economics and and all that it's uh i don't think i planned it man to be honest with you (laughs) that just Uh, kind of happened huh (laughs) yeah so uh so the guy that owns the player shop there in moses lake uh brad morrison great guy um he's supported wyatt and why it's racing since he was three. Um, granted, he was riding a Honda CR fi- or CRF 50, and then he we bought that little Predator 90 from Brad for him to, to tinker around on, and then he had the Apex, and then he had the Raptor 250. Um, Brad, Brad worked on all of those rigs. Brad built motors for, you know, his Apex. Brad built motors for his Raptors. Um <clears throat> So he, he, Brad supported him through the whole thing. So when I was talking about transitioning him into uh, UTV, um, Brad, the owner there at the player shop, was all over it. Um, and and when I started talking to him about it, the RS1 was was going to be announced. So he kind of was like, hey, you know, there's going to be some stuff coming down the pipeline. If you g- give it a couple months and uh, we'll, we'll get him into something cool. So, so we waited a little while and then, uh, the RS1 was announced and put out and, uh, financially buying that first RS1 through Bradley with, uh, with the support and sponsorship that he gave us on that machine. Um, I was into the machine next to nothing, to be honest with you. Um, but all the upgrades, thereafter it's, it's not usually the first part of the buy it's the right <laughs> they, they always say the machine's only the down payment right right, right. So, the machine's about a third right yeah <laughs> so 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 when i got the machine i was like oh this ain't gonna be bad you know i picked it up pretty pretty decent price and uh immediately started upgrading stuff um you know from kate uh, first thing was the cage right so right. i had to get a new cage and stuff on it that's like our top number one priority cage seat and good belts. And at belts. that point, that was all brand new stuff. Like it wasn't yeah. like just go and, buy it at, uh, the, yeah. at the shop. And it was super hard to source, right? Nobody was making stuff. Um, uh, ABF was the uh, only place that I could find at the time making cages for it. Um, unless I wanted to have somebody custom do one. So so that's who I sourced a lot of my stuff through for that. <clears throat> um, and uh, just kind of kind of went on from there. Um but yeah, it's uh, it's an expensive hobby. Um, without the support of uh, a lot of his sponsors, I don't know that we could afford to keep it going and keep it on the track as much as he does. Um, in 2019, I think he did uh, almost 
30 races in 2019 in his RS1, everywhere from works racing down south to northern Canada. So, and that's a lot. I mean, you think about how many weeks are there there in a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We that's we, a lot of traveling. We were traveling almost every weekend, every other weekend, um, either to California or to Canada or to Oregon or somewhere. Right, and you guys were just you know throwing it on a trailer and pulling it behind the truck and yep. going across the country to do these things, right? So, what's the what was the perspective on this when you when you as parents or financial supporters of a child trying to race like? What's the goals here? Like, wh- why it just wants to ride? Is it, do you have aspirations of hitting a certain level or being at a certain place? And as parents, do you have goals for him? Like, you're trying to push him towards and and be like, you know, we're trying to foster something here that's going to be bigger than what it is now. Like, what's the perspective? That's what there? we're hoping for. You know, we I don't want to say sacrifice because it's not really a sacrifice, but do what we can for him now. So hopefully it'll when he's an adult, he can go on his own and then we can go on a real vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what a vacation is. <laughs> I can't imagine what you guys think of a vacation is. Yeah. We haven't had a vacation where we're not racing in years. Right. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it is what it is. I mean, hit us up on go, go fund me. Right? <laughs> I think they need time more than they need money. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I'd be happy just taking a week and hopping in the motorhome and going down to the lake. Right. right. And, you know, well, I was just going to say, like, what goes into race selection? In a, in essence, is like if if they're lining up, we're gonna we're gonna make an appearance, or is it? Uh, do you want them racing against a certain caliber of competition? Like, kind of what goes into what? You, are you chasing titles? Are you chasing yeah, points? What what, uh, what races are you selecting, and why? Uh, this year has been more of uh, chasing the caliber of drivers. Um, so since eighteen, he's been racing his RS one. And then this year we moved him into the the Pro XP. Um, so 18, 19, and, and 20, he won pretty much every race and every championship that he went for in, in, in all those races. So, you know, up in Canada and, and all the quad cross races and everything that we were doing, um, he was... He was winning. He was doing great. Um, so this year was more of a, we're not going to chase championship points. We're not going to chase um, things like that. We're going to go where we know there's a, a higher caliber of drivers, uh, more technical tracks to, to uh, increase his skill and ability. Um, so that's why we were hitting works racing hard. Um, ton of good drivers in there, man. It's, uh, that's some stiff competition and the tracks alone, um, are, a, a feat, right? I mean, it's, uh, they race for an hour and it's nonstop beating on your car. It'll, it'll tax you. Yeah. And we're finding a ton of weak spots in his car. Um, he's yet to finish a works race this year cause he's constantly breaking stuff. Right. Um, so he's, He's working on trying to find the balance of how hard do I push it and and how hard do I need to push it cuz he's cuz he's he's racing right up there in the upper portion of the of the class um in Turbo Pro in works um until he breaks and then he gets a DNF. So it's not uh it's not always push it as hard as you can the entire race. It's no when to push it. And know how hard to push it, right? So to to save your car, right? And then again with the uh, best in the desert races, we were going to hit you know one of those to check that stuff out. Um, I think in this industry, um, desert racing and things like that is kind of that's the pinnacle, kind of the pinnacle, and where and where he needs to go. So works racing has introduced him to desert racing because um, there's a portion of MX and then there's, you know, five, six, seven miles of, of desert racing loop. And then you're back on the, the MX track, um, where he's really comfortable and you can see that when he's racing. Um, so trying to, trying to steer back into a little bit more of the desert racing. And that's why we were going to do, um, this last best in the desert race in Laughlin before it got canceled was see, see how he's, see how he can do in a, in a full on desert race. So are are you running a two seater for that or? Yeah, he's got his two seat pro. 
So you went from the RS1 platform, which is a center aligned single seat car that's super light, super fast and nimble, um, and naturally aspirated. And then was it about a year ago, year and a half ago that you went to the pro? Uh, this is, uh, let me get that. Er about a year ago. Yeah, it was, it was, it was in 20. So it was, yeah, it's been about a year now. Gotcha. And so, um, that's a whole different set of problems that you're facing with temperatures and, and power bands and, um, the whole different platform, right? Like it's not even, you're used to having a different platform because you had the RS1 when right. it came out, but, uh, the pro being a different chassis design for players completely. So you're, you're, fi you're fighting the, the limitations of supply and, and manufacturers and stuff at the beginning of that. Um, and then you're facing going into a turbo car. Um, what were some of the challenges of transitioning from naturally aspirated to turbo outside of just being more excited to have more power and go faster? Um, what were some of your thoughts on transitioning? Definitely the lag, not that instant power as soon as you press on the pedal. Right. Just <clears throat> learning how to keep the turbo uh, spooled up, going into the corners, and th that was a big learning curve. And two-seater, the tire placement on my right side, I can't, I can't see that tire, so... I so on the RS1, you had perfect visibility of yep. where all four corners were, essentially. Yeah, basically. And, yeah, just a huge learning curve. And how long did it get to a point where you feel comfortable with that car? Not that long. <laughs> well, we are here in Spokane, and uh, his RS1 broke. So, of course, his dad drove back to Moses Lake to pick up our, I don't even know what it was. Oh, yeah, it was a pro. Our car, toll stock. So he could race that weekend. <laughs> what's and he did what's just going through fine. your head at that point? Like <laughs> I was nervous just because of the lack of safety stuff oh, okay. compared to how his RS because the other one was just stock. We gotcha. hadn't even drove it. Yeah, that think. car was fresh off the dealership floor, <laughs> maybe point yeah. three of a mile, and I'm lining up on a pro pro gate. So you broke it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he broke it in right. Yeah, it's only heat cycles, right? You had a new belt at least, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to say, so Wyatt, walk me through race day. You, you get up in the morning. What does that look like for you? What's going through your head? What are you getting done? And uh, are, are you sizing it up? Are you doing a track walk, um, talking strategy, or are you trying to relax? Is your thumb getting sore from TikTok? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nintendo uh, Switch? <laughs> Friday nights, normally I'll go and find a friend, and we'll go walk the track. And, God, we go through every corner, inside, outside, keeping momentum what's going to be the best through here, looking at every jump face, because, you know, if it's a little off, you're going to tip sideways in a side-by-side. -side. You can't control that. Uh, talking about how the track's most likely going to deform, where the ruts are going to be, where the berms are going to build up. Um, talk through that, walk the whole track. Then Saturday, go to sleep, not extremely late. The Saturday, wake up, get blood flowing, get ready for it. Need to work on the reaction time, so we're gonna do. We're gonna. I need to figure out something for that. You drag, just need to do that drag uh, racing. You just gotta do that rocky Balboa jog in the morning and and get some find some stairs. Yeah, <laughs> I need to find something. I'm, I slack on the gate starts, but passing's getting better and better because of it. But <laughs> I'd rather just be out at the front off the beginning. Right. I mean, uh, especially when you're talking about getting into desert racing, right? Like that's a big deal to be out in front of the dust and and all that, right? So. Uh, that might be uh, <laughs> something you realize very shortly. Well, desert racing is a whole different animal. You're going to have guys out dr overdriving their car that will wind up getting taken out. So it's one of those things where you gotta you got to be patient, know when to hold back, know when to chase, know when to pressure, know when your rig's about to break. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in that works racing, it's so dusty because they don't do any track prep. It's just mark it with some duct tape and <laughs> go. And so what desert racing is, it's no prep. Yep. I mean, it's natural train, so. Yeah, I've done some XCs on moto, and uh, they'll put signs that are like maybe six six inches by six inches. Mm -hmm. People just blow past it. They're like, you didn't see the sign? I'm like, dude, nobody saw the sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did that in the last works race. We were down in Peoria, Arizona, and he he blew through a blew through a sign and ended up. Uh, busting through a tree. Busting through <laughs> some trees in his pro and. Ended up almost in someone's camping spot. So I was like, oh, the next lap flip around. a Y'all yeah. seen a race around here? <laughs> yeah. The next lap around, he comes by, and I'm like, what in the heck has he got on his car? Or there's a branch that jabbed through the front fender, and he's got like a tree sticking out there, and there's like a 12-foot, you know, 8-inch round branch 
rammed in his Nerf bar and like hanging out the back of his car. I'm like, <laughs> what is all of this? And well, after the race, I start pulling branches and everything off of his car. And he's like, oh yeah, you didn't see me go through the forest. Like, yeah, I, I just want to hear the comms traffic on a race like that. It's like, up, oh, Wyatt picked up a quaking aspen. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, yeah. So yeah, sweeping, uh, sweeping the track with the branches as I'm coming around corners. <laughs> just yeah. doing track maintenance. That's yep, right. Yeah. Yep, he was too. Was, I was so like, what the? getting back to the pr- to the turbo, what was on on your side? You know, having to deal with the mechanics and the and the maintenance and all that. What was your perspective going from the RS1 naturally aspirated to the Turbo Pro? Um, or I, yeah, it's turbo. Yeah. Yeah, it's turbo. Um, quite a bit different really. I mean, there's a lot more, uh, well, simply when I was trying to do that radi- radiator relo- relocation kit on that thing, just hosing it up. I mean, with all the intercoolers and I replaced the block and the, you know, everything else. They're ju- it's just, uh, there's just a lot more going on with a turbo, <laughs> right. turboed machine. I mean, it's uh, there's a lot more car there. Yeah. A lot more car there. It's just a lot of. A lot of stuff. I mean, it's uh, I can get in and I can replace all the suspension stuff and things like that. As far as the motor work goes, that always goes back to back to Brad down at the player shop. So he takes care of them as far as all of his oil changes. We change oil every race, tranny fluid every race. He does differentials, brand new belts for him. Um, Brad takes care of all that for him. So. <clears throat> As far as motor work goes, I don't really get into it too much. That's all. Yeah. That's all through the players. So, uh, what classes are you racing in right now? Is it just all pro turbo, or is it? Yep, open pro, pro, just whatever pro, like <laughs> pro, and it has a turbo. Oh. All right, I'm racing. Open pro and pro turbo, depending on the series that he's in. So, like quad cross is open pro, so they let. They let NA cars race with turbo cars in that class because um, you can do whatever you want to the motor. So, I mean, you can run big bores. And, so you're not and limited on... You're not limited on CCs or compression or, or heads or anything. or anything like that. Right. It's wide open. So so that's just an open pro class. Um, do you feel any kind of um, removal of limitations? Like just you feel a little bit more flexible on what you guys can do in that class? Or is it purely just, you know, going for the top? Um. It's pretty much the the highest class that they have, um, so that's why he races that class um, in in quad cross, and then in works it's just uh, uh, he races pro stock um, or no pro. I race pro production. Pro production. And in the pro production, you can do literally whatever you want to your car. So all those guys have custom built motors. Wow. So, so in a production class, you have yeah. whatever you want. That's yeah, nice. yeah. So, so you know, it might not be a reaction time. You might just be going against two hundred fifty <laughs> horsepower cars. Yeah. So yeah, they got the they got the two classes: pro stock and then pro production. And pro production's open in that one too. So, so we just I try to. So this year especially, we're tra- chasing you know s- skill and talent and and things like that. So. I want to put them in with the fastest guys, win, lose, or draw you're going to get faster chasing somebody than you're going to get uh, being ahead of somebody, right? Right. Um, You're learning more following a pro driver than you are leading a pro driver. So so it's all about the learning right now for them and and getting better. So what are some of the goals, you know, looking towards the next few years on racing? Like what what are some of your goals personally? Uh, Just be a better driver overall and bigger and sponsors and just – being able to be able to do it like more on my own and having that financial support uh, support from all the sponsors mm-hmm. to get me from race to race because eventually I want it to be a full-time job. So you're looking at this as like this is a, a career path for me versus just this is what I do on weekends. Yeah. It, yeah. It's no, it's basically been that since quad. Since three years old. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't see myself doing anything else. That's awesome. So, so what are some of your goals as far as, you know, parents, you know, obviously you want to see them graduate in the next few years, um, and, and all that now is, does college ever come up as far as a discussion on that? Or like a lot of these race teams, they're like, we want to go into the mechanical college path so that we have that skill set behind us. Right. And they, they want to bring that in. But uh, a lot of guys also just want to go out and race every weekend. So they can't, they can't afford to go into college as well. So, so we've had that talk. Um, and he's and, not a four year college student. No, it would be a trade school. So, and then that's what I'm, I'm steering him towards. Right. So once he's done with high school, 
get into some sort of trade school. Mm -hmm. Um, no matter how good of a racer you are and how fast you are, um, eventually you need to retire. Um, your body can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, so you need to have some sort of a backup plan. So if you can get into a trade school, get an electrical degree or mechanical degree or a welding degree, something that the world's always going to need. Right. Um, he'll be able to find a job after he's done racing. Um, and he has his own race team, right? Then he can, his kid will be racing by then, hopefully. And, and he'll have a good job to be able to support his kids racing. So, so you need, he needs to get some sort of a technical degree of some sort, um, some technical trade. And then, uh, that's where I'd like to see him, you know, after, after high school, I'm not saying right after high school, he could, right. he could take, you know, a year off or whatever, but he needs to get registered in some sort of a technical school. Yeah. You know, speaking of families, you got a little girlfriend or anything over there? You got time for a girlfriend? Yeah, we got. (laughs) There's always time for a girlfriend, right? Yeah. (laughs) What's your girlfriend think of all the racing? Uh, she's pretty supportive of it. Yeah. She thinks that it's cool that I'm not doing like sports like everybody else. She's just happy you're not playing Fortnite every night (laughs) and building Minecraft worlds and. Yeah. (laughs) So we've talked a little about about the car and, and everything like that. Now, um. You guys have have worked with a number of uh, sponsors, and I and you mentioned um, your buddy at Tire Blocks. Um, when did tire Tire Blocks is something that's not real familiar in the in the UTV world. Like a lot of people don't understand that that's an option. They should, uh, they should <laughs> right? So so kind of explain what they are, how you got involved with them, and what that's meant for your program. Um, so we got involved with with Tire Blocks when he started racing side by sides, um, and. A lot of tracks are rocky, and you're constantly jabbing holes in tires. Um, so talking with Kenny, um, he sells tire blocks, and they're uh, like a high-density special composite foam. Um, they're individual blocks. You line your tires with them. Um, like a 30-inch tire takes about 18 different 18 blocks. Um, and it's a run flat program basically is what it is. Um, and so you're still running air, you're still running a little bit of air. Uh, we run about, uh, eight to 12 PSI in his tires. The, the advantage of the tire blocks is you, you, you hit a rock with running eight to 10, 12 PSI. You, you run into a rock that foam cushions the blow and doesn't let that rock impact your wheel. So you're not ruining wheels. Um, and in the same time frame as, you know, you jab a, a rock or anything through your through the side of your tire, you can run the entire race. We did a... Uh, I did a 100-mile race on a flat tire, broke it the night before, and you just we put it on the front and ran 100 miles and got third out of it. <laughs> it was flat before you went to the track? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> He well, ran it, over a bone on practice. Yeah, yeah, he picked up a buffalo bone down in Burns, Oregon on Friday night <laughs> when he was uh, running the track for practice. If you ain't first, you're last, Zach. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I called Kenny, and I'm like, hey, I can't get to, you know, this tire's not going to hold air. What should I do? He says, I'll just put it on the front and, and run it. So, yeah, we put it from the rear to the front. He ran 100 miles on the tire. The tire's still, you know look just like it did when he left for the race so that's crazy so what what kind of dimensions on the tire sizes are you guys running on the pro we're running a uh 30 10 uh 14 he's uh running gbc dirt commanders this year uh that was another sponsor he picked up for the 2021 season so they've uh they're taking care of him this year for all of his tires so some of the race series have limitations on the sizing of the tires right correct and so does that 30 inch put you in kind of a wide a, a blanket. open blanket yep yeah, it's right, right, kind of right in the middle, right where we need to be. And there's also a power band difference, you know, once you get past that 30 inches, right? Like yeah. you're starting to talk about clutching changes and, and all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, how are you liking those dirt commanders? They're amazing. They, I've never had a tire that's hooked up that well with anything like rocks or even like we'll go out to Moses Lake Dunes with them sometimes and it's fine. So, um, how important does the product selection become on race day, right? Like, is it just bolt on whatever you can get your hands on or is it like you're actually putting some thought into like you've went with some hdr suspension since the rs1 day right so um you know we're talking about some suspension changes that are are pretty drastic in durability but we're also talking about a lot of weight change and a lot of um you know 
momentum change and things like that and that changes then your shock tuning and your uh, there's a whole you know cascade of effects when you start changing stuff to be beefier stronger whatever right uh what are some of those kind of thought processes you guys go in as a as a race team so on his rs1 <clears throat> again it was a new machine to the market um there wasn't a whole lot of stuff available for it at the time um so i reached out to chris mock over there at hcr talked to him um they had the kit, so we went with it. And uh, to be honest with you, it's, I mean, out of all the racing he's done and his RS1 and, and his Pro and everything else, that's one of the only things that I've never had a problem with, right? So he raced his RS1 in 18, 19, and part of 20, and it held up so great for three years of totally just beaten on it that's why i went with it with the pro i knew there was a weight difference it weighs more um and things like that but i'd rather sacrifice a little bit of weight for the durability that comes with that kit i mean it's just uh it's just some amazing stuff it's and it's and the weight's down low right right so you're not adding like a super heavy cage where it's up a high or anything like that um and you don't have to worry about it which in my opinion is like we've talked about on some of our bdr stuff like not having to worry about something is almost more valuable you yeah. know in some certain scenarios oh yeah. I, there, there's certain things that i've tried that i'll pay retail for it before i take a uh a part a lesser a promo. product yeah like if you having a solution doesn't really have a value to me nope it's what it costs right and that's the same thing like uh ball joints um when we put the HCR kit on his RS1, <clears throat> I I put the Keller Mega Joints in there, uppers and lowers, just done with it, right? Those are beefy. Yeah, yeah, totally beefy. And you know, as long as you take them apart and clean them and and maintain them, um, they last forever. Um, and so that's the same thing I put in his in his Pro. So I, I put <clears throat> when I when I'm buying things for his Pro, I'm putting known product in there. Um, everything that's on his pro he's had previously on his RS one. Um, we went with the same, same tuner, uh, Andy Malone at PWR tune, um, same exhaust, Joe Moore there at trio performance, um, which by the way, one of the best sounding exhausts on the oh, market. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, he's the guy's, the guy's work is, is great. Um, so every, everything that I've put on his pro I've previously ran. I'm not, I'm not experimenting with new stuff. The only thing that is going on his pro now that wasn't on his RS1. Um, I got a complete RCV driveline front and rear sitting on our kitchen table that I got to get put in there. Um, I've never ran anything RCV before. Uh, so you went to a solid shaft? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> BJ Leach there at Addiction got us hooked up with that. So we're going to we're gonna get that in hopefully tomorrow before we get all everything loaded up for the races. Um there's not a whole lot on that pro that we've haven't had on that haven't previously ran on his RS1. Concept cage is really the only thing that I can even think of that's different. Yeah. Uh Al Macbeth and this concept distributing cage and bumpers, nerf bars, all that stuff. So Al's cage is sick on a pro. Oh, uh, it I'll is just say so like sick. you can put, line up a whole bunch of different UTVs next to each other with all custom cages and all custom fab and all that stuff. There's something about Al's cages. <laughs> well, it's perfect. They just yeah. they look meaner. They look tougher. They look like just visually, right? They just yeah. look different, and they. Well, and so I he, love it. Yeah, I mean, I've taken a look at his cage so many times. I'm just like, that. That's what I need. Yeah. Like, it's just function. Yeah, you yep. know, looks great, but the function is just. It's so. Yeah, he just knows where awesome. to put all the crossbars sure. and the down bars and and everything in those cages. I got I got the. You got one on your car, yeah, too, right? Yeah, I, I bought two full. I outfitted two full cars through them when I, when I, when I brought both pros home. Um, I didn't even put the stock cages on either one of them. We drove them out of the trailer with the cages folded <laughs> up in the seat and in the garage. His car completely tore down and built, and my car was cage bumpers and Nerf bars. Um, now, now so. was there a little bit of this uh, backup car scenario put into play here, or is this? Uh... <laughs> well, it's there if it needs. If 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 we need to go that far, then yeah, it's there. So now he's saying that. Are you saying that? <laughs> he tries to tell us, tell me that it's our car. Uh huh. It's his car. <laughs> so I just don't know why you don't drive the RS one and and that let the boys play in the two seaters. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, <laughs> maybe, but it's gone now. So, <laughs> so do you guys ever get out on the trails and ride and and have a good time, or is it always just track days? No, we get out. Um, sh- she's been wanting to go to the, to the hills and do some riding. Um, we haven't made it there yet, but we do go out to the sand dunes, you know, there in Moses Lake on the weekends and and dink around and you know watch him jump and get a little wild and we just kind of cruise around <laughs> but yeah it's it's fun well with uh northwest utv trail riders and with social media and stuff like that you know on northwest utv and anybody that goes to the takeover events we've seen you out there you know so i'm sure there's some handful of people that actually know who you are oh, yeah. when you go out to moses are is everybody expecting a show I try to give them one. If they yeah, I, yeah, no, I mean, like I, I've we, I've been in lines where we're holding court doing wheelies and stuff like that, and it's just amazing how many people just congregate to that area and watch it. Yep. So I'm like, guys, you you got an X32, it'll do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we were out there. Um, well, me and him went out was it last weekend, and uh, I mean, the place was a madhouse. They had those drag races. You were out. Yeah, there. I was down at Pizza Cheap. Um, oh, we were out there the weekend before. We were out there Easter weekend. We didn't go out there last weekend. That was me and her. But uh, uh, the weekend before, it was still a madhouse out there. There was a ton of people out there. The weather started <laughs> getting better. People started getting Yeah. Out. And, uh, I mean, we're just parked at first pit, you know, taking a break, got back from a ride, and uh, people are just constantly walking over, checking out his car. Hey, I'm following you on Facebook. You know, I've seen this thing in, in Oregon. I've, I've seen it, pictures of it when you guys were down in Utah. You know, I wanted to see it in person, this, that, and the other. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a ton of following. Um, and and it's and that's what it's all about, right, is that recognition and, and, and getting him recognized enough to go somewhere in the industry. Um, because without the recognition – you know, that's what sponsors should, well, that's what sponsors look for is, is, is eyeballs. So, eyeballs right? Social media and Instagram is the, uh, it's the most effective marketing tool on the yep. planet right now. And it's free, Yep. you know, if you, and especially if you know how to manipulate it, I mean, uh, heck I was at a show and I've been in shows in Louisville. I've been in shows in, uh, Tennessee where people knew me from my YXZ build. Like, I mean, you're talking about people I'd never seen in my life. Right. From years but, ago. <laughs> but it had been shared so much. I mean, that car's in Vladivostok now, which is just a trip. But yeah, it's just, and, and that kind of segues me to my next question is like, racing is, um, you know, you go out there, you build your car, you build your team and you go for results. There's a social media component now. And it's almost like you, you know, results. Yeah, results almost aren't enough. I mean, I mean, there's there there's competitive UTV racers out there that have never finished in the top ten that have sixty thousand followers on Instagram. Yep. You know, because maybe I, I mean, what I, I don't want to go down that route. <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> I'm not going there. But uh, but yeah, it, it's it, it's necessary these days. It's, yeah. It, it, and it's crazy. It's basically <clears throat> taken over to where I mean, uh, a lot of racers these days are starting to develop a YouTube channel. A lot of racers uh, definitely already have an Instagram uh, Instagram account. I mean, take a guy, one of our buddies, Blake Wilkie. Blake Wilkie's br- building a, a bug trophy truck. You know, I'm sure it's going to see a racetrack. But its impact is going to be at Glamis. It's not going to be at the racetrack. It's going to be, you know, that thing's going to be on camera, yeah, predominantly. And like in terms of uh, what you guys prioritize and how you're navigating that and how things are changing, like uh, what 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 does that bring? Like from a dynamic standpoint, are you guys actively looking to generate some content and stuff, or is it just kind of take it as it comes? Um, generate content. So that's like uh, when him and I were out at the dunes, you know, last weekend, week Easter weekend. You know, we were shooting some just some some video off the phone, you know, of him hitting this, you know, couple hundred yard gnarly whoop section at, you know, as fast as the pro would go. So you could watch all the, you know, the Elka shocks and, and the HCR suspension and stuff just working. Um, so yeah, it's shooting content is, is a big deal. And, um, since we went to that takeover event in Coos Bay last year, um, I think the, uh, the content and the exposure from from takeovers is is huge, right? I mean, it's it's not every day, you know. Uh, uh, at the time, he was 14, 14 year old kid gets to line up next to somebody well known as Al Macbeth in a short course race, you know, and and again get to race that type of caliber of person, right? Um, so the the 
the content's going to come. Um, and we try to get as much content as we can. He posts videos on, on YouTube frequently. He's got a YouTube channel. You definitely have to be careful with it, too. I'm not going to name names, but I was actually uh, talking to a, you know, one of BITD's most successful racers, and he'll go out on de- dedicated shoots, and he was talking about the producers at those shoots pushing you to do things that the, you know that the car won't take. You know, so, I mean, you basically, you have to know when to draw a line because, uh, you know, certain, you know, not uh, Zach, Zach oftentimes is seen with a camera, but he knows when he's putting somebody in danger, you right. know, he's not going to ask them to do stuff like that. Joe Blow producer, not the same, right. you know, they might put you into doing stuff and, you know, we were talking about, uh, getting into racing and why I don't race. I mean, I'm still paying for the thing, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a big component of it, you know. And when, like when you stack up a calendar and and do something that takes your machine out and you miss events, it's you want to talk about stressful. Mm-hmm. My goodness. Yeah, and and you use your machine for a lot of advertisements for your business for sure, right? I mean, that's it's a rolling billboard. That's a rolling billboard for your your company. So yeah, you you tear up your machine, you break your machine, you're. Uh, yeah, you're losing you're losing advertisement at that point. So. In order to film content, you have to have assets, and if they're yep. broken, you're not filming. Yep. It's interesting how you, you know you say you're a rolling billboard. It also changes your perspective on how you act and how you present yourself. Present yourself. Sorry, that was the word I was looking for. How you present yourself to the community, right? Like if you're just a Joe Blow and an OEM X3 Turbo RR, you know, pretty much everyone's going to expect you to be a prick and, and just blow by them and, and whatever, right? But if you're a racer, if you're a personality, if you're an online, you know, presence, if you have sponsors associated with you, if you have all that, like it changes your composure of how you handle yourself. And so when you start talking about trying to generate media or trying to get eyeballs on you, right? Uh, it's real easy just to say, well, I'm going to go huck it, you know, at, you know, swing set and glamis, right. And wreck my car. Um, but at the same time, how do you, how do you guys approach, you know, your presentation and how you guys walk onto the track and how you guys like, are you focused on just racing or are you focused on like, well, I want to make sure we're perceived a certain way with these sponsors and these products. And, or do you guys just kind of focus on true and tried, like we're just here to race and prove ourselves and learn and, and whatever. I think it's a, a balancing act, man. I mean, you've got to, obviously, with a young kid racing, um, he he doesn't, he's not always, he doesn't always have the cooth that he should, so sometimes he needs to be reminded of it. Um, he can get a little bit cocky with his age. <laughs> um, but... As soon as you say something like, hey, you know, was, is that is that how you really should present yourself or is that how you should say that? He, he realizes real quickly like, oh, yeah, maybe, you know. So so as far as being respectful and things like that to all the drivers and things, I mean, he's, he's totally for that. Um, every time he pulls off the track at the end of the race, win, lose, or draw, he stops and gets out of his car talks to each and every one of the drivers hey good race you know i seen you take that line i probably should have taken that whatever the case may be um so he so he spends a lot of time talking to the drivers and and that directly reflects all the all the decals that he's running on his car right so some some prick is driving this car and it's got a giant and addiction power sports decal on there i would associate that driver with that company and maybe the guys at that company are acting the same way he is, right? right? So, so and that's why you need to hold your composure and you need to be respectful to everybody. And and especially when you do have sponsors, you gotta you gotta take it that next step, and you you gotta you know be willing to help other drivers and 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 things of that nature. And it's off the track too. It is. You it's know, on it's, and off uh, the track. <clears throat> like on on social media, I mean, you only get a you only get one chance to make a first impression, and like. Uh, uh, Face to face is usually when we're all at our best. Yep. You know, I mean, you genuinely want to engage with people and you genuinely want them to have a positive experience about it. How many times do you pull up Facebook and just want to light somebody up? Oh, yeah. It's Pretty daily. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you see stuff where you're just looking at it and you're just going, okay, that 
that's utterly ridiculous, I have to keep scrolling yeah. because I, I'm going to say something that's going to offend offend this guy. And there's plenty, you know, there's 20 people lined up to offend that guy. So just let them offend him. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. kind of where I've gone yeah, yeah. with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah and, and, and it goes, I mean, I got a trailer full of parts, right? So anybody that's got a pro at the track or a Turbo S, because we're running Turbo S axles and things like that through there, you know, they all know that if they break something on their car, if they come to me and if I've got, I mean, I got spare belts and axle, I got a ton of stuff. If they come to me and it's theirs, I mean, it's, I'm not, support I support each other. Yeah. I, I support every driver as if they were Wyatt out there on the track, whether, whether it's the guy running, you know, right next to Wyatt through the race, whether it's, you know, him first and second back and forth that happened to us in Canada a couple of years back. I mean, now don't, don't. All you racers out there, don't be planning your trailer supplies based off the fact if right. the Wyatts are going to be there or not. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Everybody might not share that much, but I mean, it doesn't matter to me what class they're racing in, who it is. Um, if I have it and it'll get you back out on the track, it's yours. Oh, man. Doug's at the race. That triple's going down. <laughs> right? Yeah. Hey, I need your spare car. I'm not that giving. That's so, so, Wyatt, uh, do you have any, like memories that stand out on the track where it was like you wanted just to throw your helmet and like <laughs> <laughs> jump on their car or um like give us an example of maybe some 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 track fun uh i just get more mad at myself than anything like oh i should have done this way better <clears throat> and if you know i'm always trying to finish first so if i'm not first then what am i doing right what, what can i do to get better how in terms of kind of the regional races and stuff i mean like when you go to BATD there's like i mean there's certain races where there's a qualification process and let's just call it what it is there's certain people that shouldn't be on the track and they're going to get weeded out when you go to some of the smaller ones uh, is that is a little it, are those the more difficult races because you're not sure who you're riding with like i've seen stock turbo cars on a track before and i'm like oh boy you know <laughs> yeah it can be especially like passing them Exactly. It, I'm just like, I'm staring at them. Like, I'll get my line figured out, and then I'm staring at them as I'm driving. Because if this guy swerves, then I'm just going to slam on my brakes. Yeah. But then again, if you're driving like an absolute idiot, and I feel you're going to put me in danger, I'll move you. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to take that over it. Yeah. So going, like I was just listening to um, the uh, S3 podcast, the uh, Dustin Jones and, and the S3 guys. Uh, Checkers or Records podcast, and they were talking about his big wreck down there, um, where he did the pirouette on his on his front end of his car and then took off again. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were talking about line selection and and how you know you start to learn you know certain people drive a certain way, so you can approach corners a certain way. Um, you know, at your level, um, have you started to learn certain drivers and their way they they're going at it, or are you yeah. fully reactional when you go on the course where you're like? You know, it doesn't matter who's on the course with me. I'm just going to ride the way I am. Or do you actually study other people? And, and like, what's your study process? Like, do you I'll, do the football footage review and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, after every race, I'm mom normally videos whatever I'm doing. And I'll, I take the phone as soon as I get there, watch it. You know, I'll be watching the guy in last because I might lap you next race or you might be in front next race. So it's it's kind of a mixture because you definitely know some people are more comfortable with just railing a corner or they're more comfortable with tucking it inside so uh definitely got to learn as you go and then if if it's a longer moto i'll follow you for a lap and see where you're leaving those things open and then i'll try and strike the next lap or if you do leave it that open it can just be reactional like i'll just go for it right and we've seen some drivers we just hope he's in front of yeah, you know they're just a little bit more chaotic. Yeah, overdriving the car. Oh yeah, yeah. So imagine. is there is there a chalkboard meeting before the race? Like, are you guys X and O and over on the board and figuring out what you're doing, your game plan is, or? No, not necessarily. Um, typically, you know, when we're on our way to the races um, during our travel time, he'll be watching you know, videos of whatever track we're going to, he'll normally start watching past videos of it and start studying up things and seeing what he can do better um, this time around than he didn't do last time. Um, and then it's just, you know, waiting to see how many cars registered, um, who they are, if there's a ton of new people, um, that plays a big part in where he wants to line up on the gate so he can make sure that to get, to get away from some of them less experienced drivers. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, what we talk about in the mornings of, of the races, right? Like, Hey, where do you want to be at? 
let's try to get you here. Um, you know, watch out for watch out for these four or five guys. They've never they've never raced before, or I've never seen them race before. Make sure they're holding their lines before you try to try to make a pass on them. Um, those are the ones that I want you to follow for a lap or two. Right. Um, as long as they're not holding you up tremendously, right? I mean, if they're holding a pretty decent pace, follow them. Figure out their lines if they're holding a line. And then make the pass. So I'm I'm all about making clean passes, and and so is he. Um, the less the less bumping and grinding, the better. Um, he it's has, usually not the case, but in this instance, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in in he in there's been a few races where you know it's been you know two laps of nonstop bumper cars to the point where after the race they've pulled him and and the other driver and was like, hey. You know why I was trying to make clean passes three different occasions these two laps, and you literally smashed into the side of his car and shoved him off the track. So, um, and he's not the and he's not the he doesn't have my temper. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, he still, even though in those driving moments and in those conditions where people are smashing into him, shoving him off the side of the track, he keeps himself composed enough to to break, get back on the track, get behind that guy and try it again. Um, and it's not just, you know, rage and just ramming into the back of the guy because he just shoved you off the track. It's, he keeps his composure and he keeps his thought process going and he stays in that racing zone. So, so I was going to ask you the same exact question that I asked Wyatt in terms of what race day is like for you. And what you're talking about kind of segues in, like when you get onto the starting line it almost sounds like you guys are more worried about the other drivers than you are about Wyatt. Oh, I by am. far. Yeah, I by would think far. so. I would think so. Yeah. Um, you know, he's he's young, but he's got a good knack for what he's doing. Um, so, yeah, my my fear is of the other drivers, not yeah. him, yeah. by far. Well, it sounds like you can find the ceiling of the car relatively quickly and then keep it there. And then you throw a variable like a bad driver in there. Who knows what's going to wind up happening? Yep. But, yeah. So what are your nerves like on race day? Um, a little nervous all the time, but new tracks or when he tried or decided to try Huckfest in Coos Bay, <laughs> I was a mess. Yeah. I wasn't ready for that. and But he does fine every time, but new tracks are scarier than... What sort of prep goes in to make a car, uh, like for what, in terms of your guys' process, what do you like to do to get some consistency on how the car flies? Because, I mean, obviously you go onto Facebook right now, you're going to have people, I mean, five people pro probably posted today how to keep their car from endoing, you know? Yeah, um, I rely on uh, other people to set up the shocks. Um, so I go through... Uh, Roll Design out of California, Doug Roll and Jed down there. Um, they've been building his shocks for him since he was on his quads. Um, I had Elkas on his Apex all the way through everything. His, Is that what's on the Pro right now? Yeah, I got Elka Stage 5s on there. Okay, yeah, because uh, I've been looking to ditch the ones on my Pro, <laughs> and I, I had somebody say Elka, so yeah. I've, I've been yeah, thinking about I, it. They're killer shocks, man. Uh, I can't say enough about them, and the guys down there know what they're doing. Cool. Um, they build them for... It's like a two-page worksheet on... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They uh, they build they build those shocks for all the top guys there in the works racing, um, Bo Barron and, and... David Hagsma. I actually have David Hagsma's old shocks rebuilt for me. So yep. they, cool. they take weight of your car and like the weight even of my body and they put all that math into the shocks. And it's, Yeah, so they know what insane. they're doing, man. And, and I've never had a, a, a bad shock setup come from those guys. Um, it's been... It's been ideal for pretty much everything that he's he's done. Are you guys currently using the same tune for short course and best in the desert and all that? Um, we just had a new tune built from Andy here. Uh, I actually hasn't even had it on the track yet with the new tune, so we just changed a few things up going going into this best in the desert race. Um, but like I said, it got canceled. So we'll try that tune out next weekend there in Horn Rapids. And so Horn Rapids is a, a short course? Uh yeah. It's on their uh their 
they're it's, big MX tri- it's like, it's, yeah, yeah, it's an MX. It's yeah. not short course. It's like motocross jumps. It, <laughs> it's Tri City's version of Washougal. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So uh, a lot of uh, nose diving off of those jumps. Uh, no, they they no. They got I, it set up pretty good. Yeah, oh, is, yeah. it, is it pretty long? Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that's nice. They got a ninety foot uh, pro taper out in okay. the middle of their track, and yeah, you know, I've done. That'll I've, be fun. I've done stadium triples on a motocross bike, and I'm good, man. Like I don't need to try that sort of stuff <laughs> yeah. on a side by side. Yeah. They got that ninety foot pro taper in the middle of their track, and watching him send it and clear that entire entire 90 footer is is amazing it's it's which is funny because like in a side by side especially a turbo uh 90 feet is like that big like right. you can easily overshoot a 90 foot table well it's coming out of a corner so not this one he, yeah. could, he couldn't even clear it on his rs1 he was coming up you know short every single time and now he's got the turbo he's just i mean it's perfect every time it's great yeah ni- 90 feet's not a big deal when you're five feet off the ground stadium triple is going to have you significantly higher than that yeah <laughs> yeah the room for error is is not good <laughs> so how do you um approach like memory management of like the jumps and managing your throttle and, and all that going into you know maybe a, a table or a double or a whatever like do you have some sort of method that you can remember that this one's a 40 miles an hour this one's a half throttle and this one's a whatever it comes more natural but like the friday before in practice if it's a tabletop which is my favorite jump you can okay jump to the middle of it okay this is how much faster i need to go jump to the very end of it and then finally clear it but a double it's more you can't Full send. <laughs> yeah you, you just got to go for it come up short then oh well so it's more of a feel thing than it is a, a memory map yeah just like the <clears throat> just like the triple in Washougal, i case that straight frame to the end of it and you can't you can't test that because i was doubling it before but you couldn't go any farther so took the inside and i just full throttle the whole way up it and i still came up short on the rs1 gotcha so um you know the way this impacts your family dynamic you know how does that how has that changed over the years like when you're younger and smaller and less scale and less frequent and all that you know it's more of like a hey you know in a couple weeks we're gonna go out for a race or whatever you know nowadays it's like when do we have time to eat and sleep and breathe (laughs) work (laughs) yeah there's uh with with as much racing as he's doing now and as much traveling as we're doing it's uh there's a lot more planning that goes into it right so looking at things like uh where can we where can we do go and possibly do multiple things right so oklahoma takeover we're we're doing that one this year um the weekend prior to uh, takeover starting on wednesday there's a race in jay oklahoma a mid-america outdoors race right um oh you're gonna be at that race so we're gonna we're nice. gonna we're gonna hammer it at the mid-america outdoor race saturday sunday Gotcha. And then go from Jay back to uh, take over there and be there by Wednesday. So it, so looking at things like that and pre-planning stuff out to where we can get the most right, bang for our buck, I guess, right? So we can do more than, than just one thing. Or um, we were talking about it the other day. We we were we had went down to Texas and, uh, you know, looking and you know, driving down through Moab and stuff. We're like, you know, if we next time we come down here th- – for a race or whatever the case may be, we need to throw our side by side in. Also, we'll stop in Moab and Take cruise, some cruise around and check out some stuff and see some sights and quote unquote vacation. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Do do a little bit more, right? So um, there's a, definitely a ton more planning going into things nowadays than there were, you know, three four years ago when we were racing only quad cross Northwest and we had, you know eight or nine races that we knew we were doing that year. Um, so when you guys are traveling, I mean, how you're doing a lot of driving, right? And that's impacting kind of your, your fleet. Right. And I just, I, you just got a new truck, right? Yeah. I just bought a, uh, a freight liner two, two weeks ago. Yeah. And you got a new, uh, new ramp on the back of that thing, yep. which is crazy. Cause I mean, it's supposed to be a trailer puller, right? Yep. And don't they're, they're normally those have like cabins on the back of them. Right. Um, some of them have the uh, cabins on the back of them. Uh, this one did not. It had the fifth wheel plate gooseneck setup. Um, the guy I purchased it from used it just to pull his fifth wheel around. Um, so I got a hold of uh, Don out of Sandfab there in Portland. Gave him some dimensions of the of the new bed layout. And uh, yeah, last Friday, 
Friday before last, I went up there, met him halfway, picked it up, I think fit like a glove on the truck. Um, and it's just an amazing rack. So our toy hauler is a bumper pull. Not big enough to fit both side-by-sides in. His side-by-sides way too wide to even fit in the toy hauler anyway. He's sitting right at 80 inches wide. So it would That's fit. a new thing for the industry too is this, all the RVs and toy haulers and all that are starting to have to re- Revamp. engineer their trailers to fit these bigger cars yep yeah so so we, we we put one on top of the truck and then we put one in the toy hauler and that's our that's our takeover that's setup. Our new setup huh yeah so that's a pretty uh slick setup and you gotten away from just kind of destroying your truck i'm assuming yeah. that was your daily truck <laughs> yeah 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 we're putting you know actually that was his dad's and his dad has let us use it as often as oh wow yeah so how many miles does your truck have that you've kind of moved off of that truck that you put through the last few years? Um, we've been averaging, uh, well, every trip down south, we're about 4,000 miles. So uh, I think last year alone, we put almost 30,000 miles on just yeah. just traveling to races. Yeah, and you figure out what that is, average mile per hour, and how much time that is. And yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a lot of, it's a lot of seat time. So so has, has mom gotten really good at... at driving the trailer and everything oh God, or, no. or is that fully on dad <laughs> fully on dad for a few more months oh you get you got your permit yet no nope. no that's no that's a good way to learn is with a trailer on the back of it yep yeah my, my dad times have changed my dad had me driving on the freeway at 11 <laughs> right yeah he's uh obviously he knows how to drive but it's they got this whole COVID thing still going on, and and they're not doing driver's ed in person. Oh, it's all online, and as we so discussed, both- he's not an online learner very well. <laughs> so, so he chooses to wait and hope that they open a, a class up in person because <clears throat> yeah. he doesn't want to to do poorly in it. So. Th- those tests suck. Like my when my <laughs> daughter went through that process, like they'll have a question like, "What's the safest distance that you can park from an open flame?" And they'll have like 100, 200, 300 feet. I'm like, well, 300 feet. No, dad, it's 200. I'm like, so is 300 wrong? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> you would think the further, the yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. 300 would be better than 200. Right. So, oh, well, that's cool. Get, get, are you looking forward to being behind the wheel like that? Or, or is that kind of like you, you're enjoying your time down to, to study and, and video and all that? Yeah, I, I like studying more. Yeah, I don't, uh, the driving speed limits. <laughs> yeah, that's something that they don't have on the track. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so we talked a little bit about takeover this year. You're actually coming on board. Uh, so I'm involved with takeover this year as their media guy, and and you guys are jumping on board as one of their ambassadors, uh, one of their athletes going throughout uh, the series. Uh, what has that been like, and what was kind of your goals with doing some of that uh, this year? Basically. Fits into your whole media yeah, and exposure. Yeah, ex- exposure and, and getting him out there and putting his name out there more, right? Um, as as we race more and as we travel more, um, things are just getting more and more expensive, man. It's, uh, it's, it's not as easy to do it now as it was, you know, three years ago when he was only doing six, eight races a year. Yeah. Um, I, but race prep alone in, from weekend to, to weekend between races, you know, it's, it's a lot of money out of pocket. Yep. So um, are you guys going to Virginia? No, we are going to miss Virginia. That's the only one we're going to miss. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's a quite a trek. I think that's the same weekend as Dune Fest too. It yeah, is. Yep. It is. Yep. Yep. And unfortunately for us West Coasters, there's a lot of loyalties with some of these events over on this side of the country. Uh, so we'll be missing out some guys, you know, that we would normally see on the rest of the event tour uh, to that event. But it, you know, the West Coast doesn't have to show up to Virginia. That place will be packed. Yeah, that event is so cool. It's it every, every side of the country has its own community that that turns out to support each other and, yeah. and all that. So, yeah. um, wife's, what do you, wife's really looking forward to Oklahoma this year. She's, yeah. Did you go last year? No. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good time. Pictures and things like that and talking to people how, you know, it's right there downtown. It just seems like uh It's unique for sure. Great. Yeah, you uh you drive on the freeway for fourteen hours and then the last two hours you spend on two lane road that's no wider than this room. (laughs) Yeah. In a big toy hauler. It's uh I I had a blast in Oklahoma. That was that was such a treat. It was a really fun event. So what are you guys looking forward to this year? Wyatt, what are you looking forward to this year? 
winning races. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is, just winning. Yeah. It's the main objective. So you don't have any kind of like destinations you're looking forward to or no? no? It's all just pin it to win it? Mm-hmm. Just yeah. not looking forward to any new places like Oklahoma or anything like that. Well, yeah, that'll. I'm sure that's gonna be fun. Every takeover is fun. It's always a good time with everybody there. So it's nice. not like so, Oregon sand out there. It's a it's a teepee. <laughs> like when you crest, you better you better not high center and not die. So sounds like some of the ones in Utah was like dead. Yeah, There's some nasty Razorbacks out there. It's like man. Utah was pretty cool. We've said it probably what three podcasts in a row now. That yeah, Utah is our new favorite place. It's. It's up there. Yeah, yeah, it's it was a good time. I mean, I'm. Uh, I just got to figure out a way to get my rig down there, and then I fly. That would be <laughs> sick. Yeah, Utah's not that far of a drive, though. I We're mean, talking. It's, no, it's not. It's just. I, I mean, I, that's a that's a day drive. I mean, yeah. you're you're there in a day. So. Yeah, what, I dri- was that was that a day for it? Well, we went across two states. It, it could be. A, <laughs> it, it could be a day trip. Problem is, we we, we went got to the west side first. Yeah, we had a late start, but like I I drive like. I don't know. I think somewhere between eighty-five to ninety-five thousand miles a year, yeah. roughly, and uh, just not looking to add more. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I get that. Yeah, for sure. So, what are yeah. you guys looking forward to? You said Oklahoma. Yeah, um, I didn't. I only went to Coos Bay last year, and it was a lot of fun. And people are so friendly. It mm-hmm. was crazy. So rock and roll bingo, man. Yeah. That's where it's <laughs> at. That's a good time. <laughs> that That's a good way to close the day out, isn't it? We, I did rock and roll bingo uh, last year in Virginia, and and one of the people come up to me and they're just going, "Hey, uh, so I have this moonshine that just came off a of Kentucky hill about two days ago. You want some?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> sure do." <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the same way it was there and. In uh, Coos Bay, that's first time, first rock and roll band. There's moonshine in Coos Bay. <laughs> oh yeah, we, yeah. There, there's there's some there too, but yeah, it was uh, that was definitely a uh, really good time. I hadn't had that much fun, you know, in in quite some time. <laughs> yeah, I, I I try to show. I, I've been there enough now that I try to show up pretty early. Like I try to show up Monday. Yeah. The the best ridings between Monday and Thursday. By Thursday afternoon, that place is torched. Yeah. You know, like, a, <laughs> well, like after you get eight to ten thousand people. That's right exactly there. what it is. Yeah. So, well, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you guys out there and seeing you rip some more, and maybe you can uh, throw down with with Al a few more times and and see where that leads. If we got a title to to defend there, uh, uh, which how many 15 year olds have that claim to? Claim to, to f- hold over. Claim to hold over him. Yeah, no kidding, uh, right? So uh, hopefully um, the car is still running uh, perfect throughout the year, and you guys are running white races and, and having a good time and uh, seeing some new sides of the country that maybe you haven't seen and and all that. Um, anyone you want to give a shout out before we wrap things up? Um, you want to talk about some of your sponsors and just all my sponsors that help keep it going: Addiction, HCR. Uh, PWR tune, GBC tires just hopped on with us this year. So, you know, best tires on the market, in my opinion, so far that I've used. Uh, yeah. Trio performance. <laughs> Trio performance. Trio performance. Joe Moore there. Brad Morrison at the uh, local player shop. I mean, without without all those guys supporting us and, and giving us deals or – Addiction kicking in stuff for free. I mean, skid plates, and I mean, they're giving us KMC wheels, and I mean, they, they've given us a ton of stuff for free. Um, those, dudes, those dudes are rad. Yeah. The nice thing about those guys, like BJ and those guys, they're racing. Like yeah. They're, they're yeah. not necessarily racing like you are, like with your with your consecutive racing, but they're I mean, out there you, racing. If you want to get technical, they're partying. That's, yeah. that's and true. Then, He's out there just having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> So, so they'll, they'll mix in some racing. Yeah, so there's fun, a trophy funny story somewhere. there. Uh, we actually, I met BJ at a race in Tri Cities, their uh, Rampage series. They got a short oh, right. course Rampage series, and Wyatt was in his RS1. And uh, again, I wanted to put him in the highest class possible, so I put him in with all the Turbo Pros in his RS1, naturally aspirated. And uh, they're out there racing, and He's just he's putting the hurt on BJ in his <laughs> in his green addiction car, you know, Turbo S. Yep. And he's in his RS one and, and Wyatt's just they get into these the the tight section, the S curves and all that stuff, and Wyatt would pull pull a huge lead on him and then it'd get on this long back stretch and 
BJ reeling, back reeling back in, of course, with that turbo. But uh, after that race, you know, and that was in 19, early 19, um, after that race, BJ's like, dude, he's like, I don't get beat very often. And to be beat by a 12 or 13-year-old kid, he said, you, you're you amazing. He said, uh, you know, gave me his business card. He's like, you guys need to call me. He says, I want to... I want to fix you guys up with some stuff and and be part of be part of your uh, racing journey and uh, yeah BJ and Trevor those guys have been with us since since then I mean just helping out anytime they can um, getting stuff shipped to me overnight because we needed something for the next day having stuff shipped to UPS stores in Utah because you know I broke his antenna off his car and I mean it's just. Whatever they can do to help me out, them guys just bend over backwards. They're a and, huge help. And they'll do that for anybody. Yeah, they yeah. do. Yeah, they're great. There's just an awesome bunch of dudes there. So, Well, I've enjoyed having you guys. Finally, we've been trying for a while to have you guys up here, and you guys were happening to be swinging through the through the, the city. So uh, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for coming out uh, raging. Yeah. Uh, got that right two times in a row. <laughs> Um, so Wyatt, stoked to have you guys out. We'll definitely make some content while we're out, uh, together at these various events. Um, and, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys' you know, careers kind of keep moving forward and, and changing. And I'm stoked to see that, um, there's a level headedness to all this, that it's not just, you know, throwing money at the wind and seeing what happens. And, no. um, this is definitely a family thing. It's, and I think, in most racing families, it, it's a family thing, but you know, to see the entire family like on board with it is is always a good good sign right. of a healthy family dynamic, um, and that that mom's not too upset with the bills. <laughs> yeah, and it, and and it's deeper than just you know the the three of us. Um, my uh, my dad, um, he just retired this year, but uh, even last year and years prior, I mean, he would try to go to every race humanly possible that he could get time off from work this year he's retired so he's planning on going to basically everything with us he's been to every works race with us this year so far down in arizona and california and all that stuff so he's been traveling with us to those um uh, my mom was the same way before she passed um constantly supportive and and helping us to get to where we need you know my dad loaning me his truck for two years basically for just going to races so it's a it goes a lot deeper in the family than just the three of us her mom's supportive of us um and what we're trying to do for him as well so so if you guys just like wrap things up and and bring it to a close what would you tell yourself you know now where you guys are at what would you tell yourself five years ago if you could there's a lot of racers that, that want to be racers or whatever that are looking at trying to get into the sport and trying to figure things out and, and all that kind of stuff, homegrown efforts. What would you tell yourself as a family or individually, you know, five years ago? Um, I would have done things a little bit different. I don't know that uh, we would have necessarily jumped into so many races. We probably would have went out and shot more content and got more exposure and built that following prior to racing um in 19 he had he i think he won 32 races and he took home four season championships and you think that would be just like this 13 year old kid has beat adults all across the united states and canada you think the exposure would be huge on that but it it wasn't right exposure you know going out and shooting videos of just you know simple things like ripping through the whip section or, you know, doing wheelies or, or jumping and things like that. It seems like that's where the exposure comes from and build that following prior to, you know, getting into racing. It seems like that's what the sponsors want to see. Right. So, and I think, I think what you're saying is don't expect the media to happen. Make the media yourself. Make the media yourself. Yep. Yep. And I think that's the big yeah, lesson right now is. in the industry is, is uh, I've even just with what I do, you know, being media, I expect I expected early on certain things to fall into place, and it doesn't happen unless you go and get it yourself. Right. Zach could talk for probably twenty to thirty minutes from a content generation standpoint. I think people get into it expecting it that if I do something rad, it's going to take care of itself. That's not how it works. No. This is a full time job. Yep. Right. 
No, it definitely is. And and a lot of families are, are converting into that process where you have your racer part of the family, you have your logistics part of the family, and then you have your media side of the family. And, and someone kind of all takes the reins in, in some of those aspects, right? And so... We just need to adopt a media media guy. <laughs> <laughs> or just hang out with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah right? exactly. Uh, it goes back to the, you know, not what you know, and sometimes it's who you know and where you're, where you're at. So. Honestly, 60 to 70% of it is who you know. Yep. So... Anyways, uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, it's been a great time having you guys here. So glad to have you in the studio and not over Zoom. Uh, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, look forward to uh, this race season and everybody coming together around this community and supporting each other and having an awesome year. So Should be a good one. For uh, everybody else out there, peace. Peace. <laughs>